Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. Used to be the Tim May Podcast, but On3.com, uh, in all of its infinite wisdom, has changed has changed the names of all these things to show. So this is the big show, the big show on, on On3.com. And I'm pleased to welcome in a, a co-pilot for this week, a fellow I've been wanting to get on for a while. And we won't get into the background on that. He had a little bit of a, a, a personal tragedy involved in the middle of the uh, football season this past this past fall. But uh, Stephen Carpenter, welcome to the Tim May Podcast. Excuse Thanks for having me. me. Welcome to the Tim May Show. I'm sorry, man. I want to get a, <laughs> want to throw a quarter in a in a bucket every time I say the Tim May podcast. But uh, welcome to the Tim May Show. Finally, Stephen. Finally, yeah. Thanks for having me. I really do appreciate you having me on. Yeah, and everybody's going. Well, who is this guy? I mean, uh, <laughs> he looks pretty good on the screen there with those headphones on and stuff, and he's got that picture of Chick Harley over his uh, what would be his left shoulder, our our right side, and uh, and uh, East High School embroidered looking uh t-shirt or, or sweatshirt there who who is this guy well this guy is a is a young man still at least compared to me who has <laughs> just decided years ago to put together a screenplay for a movie about chick harley the guy who would have won probably a couple of heismans if the heisman trophy had been invented then uh, had been founded then but way back in the teens of ohio state football history the 19 teens of Ohio State football history, he is, you know, by far the young man who not only helped Ohio State beat Michigan for the first time ever, but put Ohio State football truly on the map in, in terms of the big time. And uh, Stephen, uh, once again, welcome to my show. And uh, just, uh, number one, give people a little bit of a, a feel for why you think this story, which is one of the great stories ever told, has not been on, on a big screen somewhere before this. I mean, uh, Chick Harley, what more interesting character can you ever run into in life than that fellow? Well, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he played over 100 years ago. A lot of it had to do with the fact that a really ugly rumor got spread around in Columbus that Chick's mental problems were, was a result of him having contracted a venereal disease. <laughs> in, a, in those days, um, that type of a um, stigma stigma it it they didn't want to make it public and they didn't want to pursue it they didn't want to have there be a possibility that that could come out because i think they were just trying to protect chick so a lot of a lot of people just left his story alone basically they were concerned that that might surface um that is not true yeah. Uh, he never had anything like like that. Um, his um, uh, nephew, Richard Wessel, acquired records from the uh, Veterans Administration Hospital in Danville, Illinois, when he began to write his book about his uncle. And he found reports that Chick was tested and, and it was um, negative for any uh, venereal disease. Yeah. But, yeah. But but what intrigued you about the Chick Harley story? First, first, let's uh, truth in advertising here. I mean, your research includes all kinds of things. You know, I, I mean, you sent me some of the uh, some of the background stuff, and you really you almost go down a rabbit hole when you start looking into a fellow like this, right? And you you uncover things. But obviously, part of your research in, included uh, the book uh, written by my good friend, uh, former coworker at the Columbus Dispatch, Bob Hunter, who I thought wrote a, wrote a great book about chick harley and uh, uh revealed some things that uh, were just wow you know uh what an interesting character this was this this fellow was and what an interesting time he lived in and boy did he deal with some uh, great people and some deceitful people all to say you know sometimes at the same time and stuff but what intrigued you most about the chick harley story that wanted you that, that made you or compelled you to to do a screenplay on it well i mean i was born in Columbus. So it's a, it's a Columbus story. Yeah. Uh, when I first came across the book, it was um, April of 2009. I came across it at a, a Barnes and Noble's bookstore. And um, I was familiar with Chick because he died on um, April 21st of 74. That was a week before my birthday. Huh. And I remember my dad reading the dispatch and, and talking about Chick Harley. You know, at the time I was 10 years old, so I wasn't that familiar with him. Um, so when I saw that book that day, it just kind of brought back some memories of childhood. Um, when I got into the read, though, it 
it became pretty obvious that this near cinematic tale, as it's been described, was exactly that. Um, and I was kind of wondering myself, why didn't somebody go to the next step and take Bob's work and turn it into a script? Um, I guess the only answer for that was, is maybe I was supposed to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I would encourage anybody that that's out there that it is a Buckeye fan. If you don't have Hunter's book or Wessel's book, please, you know, you need to, to get these books. Yeah. Um, they're incredible reads and it tells an incredible story about a man that um, is responsible for launching the Ohio State football program as we know it today, one of the premier programs in the country. Yeah, let's give people a little bit of an update on, I mean, as much as you can on where this, because you and I, you know, you and I ran into each other at a Roosters, uh, you know, Roosters restaurant of all places um, several years ago. And you, are, you, you know, you handed me that script. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a kind of a cool read because it's like one of those things you just keep turning the page, as I call it, a page turner. <laughs> and uh, so number one, uh, but then number two, uh, you know, obviously, uh opportunity kind of ran into you. Cause like you said, you got laid off from a, you know, one of those big, uh, one of those big shutdowns, what in 2009 or whatever it was, you know, they caught a lot of people uh, hanging. Uh, you turned your attention to doing basically this, uh, you know, right, putting a script together. And now of course, what's that old line? Anybody can write a script, but getting it, uh, get, getting it to, to what, what, what's the word I'm looking for there? Getting it to fruition, meaning uh, having a, a producer or somebody grab it or production house grab it and turn it into a movie uh, is is the hardest part that, thing you can do. I know the guys involved with Buster Douglas have been trying for a while now to get a, a movie made of his ridiculous uh, rise to fame. And I'm, I happen to uh, witness that firsthand and have sat in with several screenwriters as they've tried to put uh, – uh, scripts together and then get it to the movie but it hadn't happened yet but uh where does it kind of stand right now i know you can't give a lot of details but where does it kind of stand right now in terms of possibly finally getting to the big screen one way or the other so you can see we have like little windows uh, yeah it it looks like this going to happen um my only my only frustration is right now is i can't give you the exact specifics like you've already mentioned um that's okay I don't believe... worry about the people taking the tour there <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe that um, that Mike is hopeful that we can get this thing shot in the can and and release sometime in 24, um, which would be a really advantageous time because of the fact that the Big Ten is expanding the conference. Yeah. So you can use that Big Ten expansion as a platform to promote the film. Yeah. Um, Wait a minute, you know, interrupt. Hopefully... And by Mike, you mean Mike Pollock? Is the yes. fellow like you're you're referring to? Yeah. Uh, let me give you a little bit of history on Mike Pollock. Um, Mike and I met in 2014 at the uh, Scott Antique Show. That it was the Thanksgiving show. Um, at that time, Mike was a movie producer and he was dabbling in the antique business. He didn't quite have his production legs under him. But I mean, this is a man who grew up around the film industry. He had two cousins that worked in motion pictures, Bernie Pollock and the late Sidney Pollock. Those two gentlemen are his second cousins. Wow. So he grew up around the business. Um, when, when I introduced Mike to the material, uh, the day that, that we initially talked, um, his first thought was uh, beautiful mind, but football. And my first thought was, well, I want to tell a Columbus story. You know, I want to tell the story of Chick Harley, but most importantly, I want to tell the story of the greatest rivalry in American sport. And getting back to the question you asked me just a few minutes ago, that that is one of the main things that made me believe that this would make an incredible film. Um, ESPN voted Ohio State and Michigan on the football field to be the greatest rivalry in all of American sport in the 20th century. And that story was never told cinematically. And I just thought at that time, you know, somebody needs to try to get this story told on the big screen. Yeah. Um, of course, now we're looking at an episodic television series and, and that's fine um, because it, like I said, um, mentioned to you earlier i think that format will give us an opportunity to tell the whole story yeah and and do it in in a way that that people will be able to uh digest it and, and, and enjoy it yeah I, I i agree uh you know and uh you know 
man, I'm a guy who's visited uh, the grave, the grave site uh, of Chick Harley, you know, and the great, uh, the great, the, the great little uh, uh, excerpt from uh, James Thurber that's on his gravestone, which is cool as heck. I visited mm -hmm. his uh, home site over there. There's actually a monument over there. Uh, where his home site over in East Columbus, which right there, right there next to where uh, Interstate 70 divided, you know, neighborhoods yeah. and stuff. Uh, and it's it's really cool. I mean, and I think a lot of people have grown up knowing about Chick Harley. A lot of people haven't. I mean, and really, like I like I prefaced with earlier, I mean, he's a guy that finally put this behemoth, which is Ohio State football now. He's he's the young man. If you want to point to a person, uh who spurred it all to the big time. It was Chick Harley who grew up in East Columbus, went to East high school, was a local, you know, a local superstar and a little guy, really, when you, when you think about it in football terms, but nobody could tackle him, you know, on a consistent basis, et cetera. And uh, I'm just wondering for you, as you, as you got into this uh, research, what intrigues you the most about his story? Was it his athletic prowess, which helped him gain fame and glory? Was it uh, obviously the uh, the mental uh, the mental uh, problems he developed as as life went on, uh, and and how he kind of got out of that morass? Uh, what 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 was it that intrigued you the most? Well, I think the the thing that intrigued me the most was first of all it was a Columbus story, you know. Um, yeah. Columbus has a lot of great stories, um, Chicks being one, and obviously Buster Douglas' story being another. Um, and hopefully, maybe, who knows, you know, if this is a successful situation, maybe that will open the door for getting the Buster Douglas story told. Um, but a lot of what you just mentioned is, is, is what intrigued me about the story. I mean, it's the fact that you're dealing with a man who suffered from severe mental illness that was able to catapult a university to, to the the uh, national football prominence that it enjoys today. Uh, and the one thing that really intrigued me was the fact that this, this was a man that wasn't deserted. When you get into his story, it's a story of friendship. He had a lot of friends and they never deserted him. St. John, he, he could have walked away from Chick Harley. He got what he needed out of Chick Harley. He could have walked away. Yeah. We're talking about the athletic director at Ohio State back yep. in the St. teens and St. 20s. John. L.W. St. John, yeah. L.W. St. John did a lot to try to help Chick. He, he took him to different sanitariums. Um, they would have um, charity functions to raise money to help Chick with his medical expenses. Um, this is a love story. I mean, it really is. And Bob Hunter coined it that way. And when you get into it, and, and, and hopefully – you know, when the series is shot and, and, and it goes out on television, that part of the story will be very obvious. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. But all, you know, I always said they ruined the first Top Gun movie with a love story, but I, but that's me, <laughs> but no, you're <laughs> exactly right. Louise, well, what was her name? Louise, his, uh, his uh, Louise Havens. Yes. Yep. She, she played a major role and uh, she was part of it. She was there when he was first admonished or almost banned, you know, so to speak from, uh, from, from, the society she lived in to like sticking with him, right. Sticking by his side and finally coming. She wanted to marry Chick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, her family leaned on her pretty hard yeah. um, and convinced her that that wasn't going to be possible at that time. Uh, psychopharmacology wasn't as advanced. A person with schizophrenia really couldn't live a normal life. Yeah. They just didn't have the medications to help them today. It's a little bit different, but at that time, Chick would never have been able to to been a father and a husband to her. And she kind of came to that realization. But but her family leaned on her and and uh, kind of convinced her that she was going to have to step away from the romantic part of that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then, of course, you know, I mean, the civil rights movement for whatever it was back in. I mean, obviously, his best friend or the guy that really looked helped it looked after him, a lordy. I mean, you know. Tell a little bit about that, where he basically uh, stood up for his rights also. Well, that part of the story I'm not familiar with. Um, so I would have to deflect that question to um, Simon Miller, the writer of the of the um, screenplay. OK, um, I was never familiar with that character. I'm, I'm not sure if that's an embellishment or if that is somebody that actually in Chick's life. 
Yeah, that's I'm just that's, not sure. Yeah, that's what I was wondering though. I mean, you know, you know, you can't help it. You know that when you make a movie, they become composite characters. You know, in some form or fashion. Right. Are they? You know, and I, I know a couple of the screenplays have been written. For example, about Buster Douglas. You know, I just I got to read them because I was part of like uh, like help helping the the screenwriters i'm just going well, where did this come from you know what i mean right. <laughs> and yes. uh including me having glasses that were held together by by tape you know by one of them <laughs> I, I said i didn't even wear glasses back then my man uh, mm -hmm. i got real upset about that one but uh but yeah that is you know it is part and parcel to the uh to to the uh to the making of some of these things sometimes the uh, sausage that comes out the end right but yeah. uh but i didn't want you want to ask you about this is as you looked into this and researched this and stuff, how much of what happened do you think with Chick was stuff he imagined happened to him and actually happened to him? If you follow me, uh, this, uh, you know, because he did obviously deal with some mental, uh, obviously some mental obstacles. Uh, but just what's your take on that? Well, um, I mean, once again, I'm at a, I'm at a disadvantage because I haven't had an opportunity to talk with Simon Miller or actually see the script. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that Miller may have had some opportunity to talk with Todd Wessel. Uh, Todd is Chick's great nephew. He's family. And he obviously would be privy to some things that the general public wouldn't be. So yeah. I'm, I'm just guessing that that might be where some of the uh, uh, embellished characters are coming from. I, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel pretty confident that the one character that they call the man in spats, that's probably a uh, an embellished character that's a product of Chick's psychosis. They they did they did that very effectively in a film called *The Beautiful Mind*. Yes. So I'm guessing that that's what uh, the the screenwriter had in his mind when he invented this character. Um, when my, when Mike Pollock and I talked, like I said back in '14, he had a vision, and that is a beautiful mind, but football. And my vision was I wanted to tell the story of Chick Harley and the greatest rivalry in American sport. And uniquely, he hires a screenwriter that's from Chicago. So I'm no, I'm just guessing, but I think Simon Miller had a vision. He wanted to tell the Chicago side of the story. Yeah. So uniquely, what we have is this opportunity to tell a story that's going to blend all three visions. And and based on the fact that we're doing an episodic television series, you 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 have enough room to do all that. So I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be a really top notch project. Yeah, no, no, no matter how it's told, I mean, obviously there was uh, the, you know, the whole deal with the uh, Chicago Staley's, which turned into the Chicago Bears and how uh, George Hallis is sort of like the villain to a certain extent in this screenplay, uh, it appears, you know, the, the, the quote unquote, uh, former owner founder, but he wasn't really the founder of the Chicago Bears, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it's just a fascinating how Chick was sort of used by the system uh, in many respects, but you know, the way LW St. John never abandoned him because obviously LW St. John and the powers of be at Ohio state used the fame and glory that chick and his, his teammates helped develop in the late 19 teens to build the house that Harley built, you know, yep. Ohio stadium and take Ohio state to that next level uh, that rarefied air, which a uh, few national programs, have ever gotten to, and uh, they had the uh, foresight to know that this was a big thing coming down the pike. And 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 the bottom line was, uh, uh, Chick Harley, more than anyone else, probably helped get them to that point. And uh, let me ask you, you know, is as you as you research this, and for example, reading Bob's book and uh, Wessel's book, um, is it? How would you describe if you had to if you had to describe Chick Harley? in a nutshell about what he was all about. And at the one time, at one point he seems, and in one essence, he seems sort of bashful, stand back. On the other, on the other hand, he seems quite uh, uh, strident and would step forward uh, to a certain extent to, uh, to assert himself or his rights, et cetera. How would you describe him? I, I would probably call Chick Harley an athletic savant. <laughs> really? <laughs> be quite honest. Explain I mean, yourself. Well, I mean, this is a guy that could run a 10 flat hundred, you know, he could punt a ball, he could kick a ball, he could drop kick it. 
in those days, the, the, the ball is more spherical shaped like a basketball. Yeah. Just hey, when we were drunk, there's this famous picture of him holding a football up against his head like a quarterback. Yep. The football looks almost as big as his head. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, uh, you're exactly right. Now go ahead. Well, he had he had big hands. Yeah. So that allowed him to be able to do that. And uh, um, back in October, I met another fellow who had big hands. His name was Rex Kern. Yeah. And uh, Rex said, you know, having big hands in the game of football is, is an advantage because you, you can do things that, you know, a fellow with smaller hands just simply can't can't do. And that was the case for Chick. Um, he was somebody that um, he didn't care for for school. He um, had 48 credit hours at Ohio State. He never graduated. Um, for him, learning was was a, was a chore. Um, and I think a lot of that might have had to do with the fact that I, he probably suffered from uh, a learning disability. You know, I think he had attention deficit disorder, and that was probably a product of the uh, up and coming at schizophrenia that, that eventually overtook him. Um, so, you know, but he had this incredible athletic ability. You talk about a guy who was five foot eight. I mean, they listed him the heaviest. I've seen him listed as 165 pounds. Yeah. I honestly don't think he was even that heavy. But but here's a guy that could um, run a 10 flat hundred. And um, back in those days, they were few and far between. Yeah. There just wasn't a lot of guys that were that were that fast. And, and when you read about his running style, you know, Chick would – would get the ball and he, and he would delay. He would just hold. He would just kind of shuffle his feet and just kind of wait and he'd wait and he'd wait. And then he'd get the defense out in front of him and he'd get it, get it in his mind where where to go. And, you know, he, he saw things, I guess, like a Joe Montana kind of a mind where he, he could see things in the defense and he knew where he had to go to, to break open a run. Yeah. Um, I hope that we can capture that kind of uh, thing in, in the uh, upcoming uh, – television series you know where yeah. he's able to you know kind of look at the defense and see the holes and 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 just break loose but he had a he had a third gear you know he had that ability to to turn it on and 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 get out on the corner and get past the corner uh ferris campbell i think is a guy you know when i think that had harley speed especially yeah. that run he had against michigan back in 18 we got around the corner and that was all she wrote harley was like that he was kind of a cross between uh, um, uh, Campbell and Braxton Miller. I mean, this is a guy that – Pete Stinscombe, you say trying to catch Harley, it's like trying to catch a cat. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that, that, that's, that's what's fun about it is hopefully we, we can recreate that, that uh, mystique and, and, and that um, ability. Yeah. And it, you hope, you know, you hope when this comes out, it is a, there is a lot of football in it if they can recreate it, you know. Uh, but then number two, man, you just wish, why weren't video cameras and cell phones with cameras invented way back when? Because yeah. there's very little, if any, film of him doing his thing, you know, and it's uh, scratchy at best. And boy, he just been in Ohio field, uh, just uh, some of the photos that, you know, you can find, but they're, they're still, pretty rare aren't they i mean i know you found a lot of photos uh, uh yep. etc in this in this research right what wh yep. which ones kind of stick out for you oh i mean i managed to acquire a few of them i've got chicks 1913 east high school football uh picture um uh, there's a story to that i would based on our time limits i won't get into it no but, go uh, ahead i mean yeah um well it was in pair it was in um um it was in Europe and the, um, the guy was in the Navy and he had acquired it from a, the estate of a fellow named Lester Merritt and Lester played with Chick at East High School and, and the fellow who was in the Navy, he was stationed in Rome. So this picture goes from Columbus all the way to Rome, Italy. And he has sent me pictures of it in the spring of 17. And then in the fall of 17, I'm on eBay one day and, and the picture pops up. So I emailed him and I asked him about the situation. He said, well, um, his wife was pregnant with twins and they were wanting to retire in Italy. So he was selling off his Ohio State collection to come up with the money to buy a place um, in Italy. So I was able to acquire the photograph. So it goes from Columbus to Rome. Now it's back in Columbus where it belongs. Yeah. <laughs> Over then, a century um, later. <laughs> yep. It, it, it belongs in Columbus. Did you and, pay him in um, lira or dollars? 
I paid him in, in dollars. Okay, that I'm just cost, messing with you. <laughs> yeah, Euros, probably. Uh, yeah, it, but, it cost me a little bit, but it is what it is. Yeah. You'll never get another one. Yeah. Well, get, yeah, I mean, give me another example, too, man. I mean, do you have any, you know, obviously, did you acquire any from, like, the Ohio field days or anything like that? Um, I haven't yet been able to acquire an Ohio field. I, I acquired something that's extremely rare. Chick went through aeronautics training at Ohio State before he left for his uh, flight training at Southard Field. Um, he was in Squadron 34, him and a fellow named Bob Spears, who was on the 1919 team that beat Michigan for the very first time. This photograph turns up on eBay. And through my research, I knew that Chick had gone through aeronautics training at Ohio State. And the listing came up as um, Ohio State military aeronautics 1918 and i thought to myself well i know harley was in school at that time so i clicked on the link and all i could see was the upper por portion of the of the image and um so i downloaded it onto my desktop and then i was able to see the whole thing and there in the front row sit chick harley um i acquired that uh off of ebay and um the archives at ohio state didn't even have that wow so i was i was able to get them a copy of the picture so at least they have a record of it in their archives but yeah. that's a really rare photograph yeah as you, as you point out i mean uh chick harley uh in the front row fourth from the right if i remember correctly and Correct. uh it's really interesting in that photo too man uh where you could see some football you know perspective because he's a, like the smallest guy almost in the front row you know what i mean yeah i mean <laughs> it, you know it, you know, it's it's really it's really wow. I mean, I, I just had this thought it, it, that two of the greatest players ever at Ohio State, you know, the, Archie Griffin, the only two time Eisman Trophy winner, and Chick Harley were small in stature, you know, yep. but boy, did but they, they play did big things. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and from the same basically same area of town, you know, the east side. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, 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 Archie Griffin went to Eastmore High School. Uh, Chick went to East High School. Correct. But it is that is amazing. And and then of course Hopalong Cast he went to West High School, if I remember correctly, right? Or Central, one of those two. Yeah, Hoppy was at Central. Central, I yeah, knew, exactly. I knew, yeah, I knew a lady that went to high school with him. Um, so um, yeah, she right across the river there now, yep. Osa or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she kind of gave me a little bit of insight into Hoppy, but but he was a good guy. Yeah, um, but but Hoppy was a scrapper. You know he. He 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 could um, hold his own. Is what what they well, used to say. Well, see now, I'm giving <laughs> you three projects. Number one, you're you're getting this Chick Harley thing finally made. You've been the impetus to this. You've been the spur that's been getting the Chick Harley uh, anthology, for one of another term, uh, made. You can do one. Uh, then you can do one on Hop Cassie because he was an interesting character in his own right. Helped Woody Hayes win his first national championship, and then of course you can do one on Archie Griffin because. To only two time Eisman Trophy winner. There's been there's been movies made about other lesser characters in uh, college football history than Arch Griffin. Maybe he's too nice of a guy to make a movie about. What do you think? Huh? Well, I, I mean, those those fellows are still alive, obviously, so they would have to be the ones to make that decision. Um, but I I think that well, Hop's would, not. You know, Hop passed away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forgot about hot passing. But it could be it could um, be the anthology of, of Ohio State greats from Columbus, Ohio. You know, at least it could play at the Ohio Theater every summer yeah. or something. But uh, but let's get back to real quick about Chick before we before we uh, finish wrap this up. Uh, uh, when Chick, you know, from what you put together and stuff about Chick at Ohio State and stuff, was he? <laughs> Like you, you talked about a while ago, like maybe, you know, he had a little bit of a learning disability and stuff, but uh, he found a way, right? I mean, is that is that sort of, in the end, he did come out the other end, right? And uh, was feted, F-E-T-E-D, uh, by Ohio State and people into the 40s, you know, before he finally passed away and stuff. But uh, is that, this does have a happy ending, right? Yep, it sure does. Um the way I had written it up in, in my work, um, I touch on the, the return visit in 1948, um, and, and they're going to they're going to visit that in the television um, series. Um, Chick endured um, insulin shock therapy treatments in 1947. He decided to, to do that. Um, 
he had been in Columbus, I believe it was 1936. He was here for the Jesse Owens banquet. Then there was a 12 year hiatus away from Columbus. Um, and he got uh, transferred to the uh, Veterans Hospital in Danville, Illinois from the Heinz in Chicago. But he decided to undergo this insulin shock therapy. So he, he, he goes under like 47 treatments of which I think 44 actually put him into a, a diabetic coma. Yeah. So if you can just imagine what, what, what that's like, yeah. um, but he did it and, and he came out the other side um, where he was able to um, somewhat get his life back. Um, I'm no psychiatrist, so I can't explain to you what exactly happened to his brain when he went through this. Um, but um, he was able to, come back to Columbus I believe he came back in 47 for a, a game with his brother Bill and then in, in 1948 they decided to bring him home for the Michigan game so on November 19th he rolls into Columbus it was a cold damp dreary day well word got out Chick was coming home 75 people line high street they pick him up at the uh, uh, Union Station put him in a touring car convertible and they and they take him down high street to the state house and it was a cold damp jury day it was, it was just miserable they get him to the state house and all of a sudden the clouds break the sun comes out and a rainbow appears yeah. so we're going to explore that in the in the television uh, series wait you said 75 people lined high street you meant 75 thousand yeah exactly <laughs> 75 that'd be a guy on every corner <laughs> yeah. Seventy five thousand yeah. people turned out to welcome him home yeah. And Chick, Chick said, well, I'm not deserving of this. And I, I don't think that's right. Yeah. I think you know, he was. Yeah. You know, the band did, the, the <laughs> band did, I think a script chick or something, I think at the, at the game, you know, and, uh, and when, when that game, he first came back and, and, you know, when you look at Chick and you look at script Ohio, there's just those little parts missing in the seas. I mean, you know, it was right. I mean, they were almost made for each other, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, I don't mean to get uh, sappy here, but uh, Ohio just completes the circles. And uh, he finally got his circle completed, which, wow, just it's just crazy, yeah. man. And, you know, I've always wondered about Chick Harley, uh, a fellow that dealt with the problems he had, how much just get hit in the head. You know, obviously his first claim to fame was rising up as a, a, a young boxer because he probably was a little guy in his neighborhood and had to prove himself. And then all those hits he took as a running back, when you're wearing basically a little leather helmet, which you're probably just as well off with without one as you were with one. You just wonder how much that, you know, with what people know about CTE and things now, how much that affected him as his life went on, right? Yeah, well, I mean, he was probably predisposed to schizophrenia based on, on what I was able to get from Todd Wessel's book was that there was a history of mental illness in the family. In the family. He had, yeah. two, he had two well-documented concussions, one against uh, – Newark in a football game in 1912 him and a kid named Moore were diving for a pass and they hit head on and both of them got knocked out cold wow and Chick had a pretty big gash on his head they called the game then the spring of 13 I believe they were playing Mount Sterling in a baseball game and his friend Hap Courtney got into a fisticuff with a Mount Sterling player and Chick ran to Hap's aid the ump's trying to break up the fight he, he had picked up the baseball bat and he's kind of moving around with it, trying to separate the kids. And he ended up hitting Chick right upside the head with that baseball bat. That wow. knocked him out. So he has two major concussions probably within seven, eight-month period. Yeah. Um, did he have CTE? I think if you take into consideration the fact that they're playing in leather helmets, uh, there's probably a pretty good chance that he might have suffered from some CTE along with the schizophrenia. Uh, I would say that that's a very strong possibility. Yeah, yeah. Hey, last thing, is it is it amazing uh, to you as you look back on it? Because you're obviously you're a Columbus fan uh, as well as an Ohio State fan. And uh, but is it amazing to you? And we've talked about this earlier, but what his impact was. I mean, this diminutive fellow with great athletic ability rises up from a neighborhood in East Columbus. And there's that huge building like we talked about over there a while ago. Is it? Does it kind of give you goosebumps a little bit just to think about, you know, what one person, the impact one person can have, you know, in this yep. world? It surely does. Um, you know, I work for the university. I walk past the house that Harley built every day that I go to work. 
you know, and, and, and there, there's times late at night, it, you know, it, it touches you. It really does. Yeah. Um, to stand in that rotunda. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yes. So. Unbelievable. Well, Hey, let's end it there, man. Uh, Stephen Carpenter, finally, we, we got together, man. And, uh, um, and I hope this thing gets, go, goes to fruition. Uh, and that's my favorite word evidently for today, mm -hmm. fruition, but I hope this thing goes to fruition because I think it could be a very compelling, uh, uh, series to watch. And, uh, and like you said, I'm glad it's going to be a series and not a, um, a minute 39 second movie or one hour, 39 minute movie. You know what I mean? Uh, yep. shoehorned into a box. I, I think it's because there are, there are a lot of layers to Chick Harley, not just to Chick Harley, but, but his impact on life and, and things that flowed after him. And, uh, and, you know, from, from heck his participation or trying to participate in world war one, you know, to, uh, to everything else that went on as a, as an aviator. So, uh, Stephen Carpenter, welcome. Um, thank you very much for joining me on the Tim May, on the Tim May and, show, my man. And thank you, Tim. I just wanted to leave you, um, with this, yay chick, yay Ohio. <laughs> there you go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Script chick. I mean, I like that. They want to do that every now and then just for the fun of it because his name's finally up there, you know, on the front edge of the uh, of CDEC. So, uh, wow. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's Stephen Carpenter. Uh, my name's Tim May. This has been the Tim May Show. And until next week, we'll see you then. Take care, Tim. Bye-bye.